Hello everyone. This video is to record several sections of the beginning of chapter 10 in intermediate accounting. So we are going to talk about property, plant, and equipment and intangible assets, which is sometimes considered part of property, plant, and equipment. So a lot of things can be bundled up into these categories, but ultimately any kind of property, plant, and equipment, or also known as PPE, and intangible assets are going to be long-lived assets, so something that lasts at least more than a year, and it is expected to bring us revenue in the future. So those are the things that are going to fall under these PPE and intangible assets. So in this chapter, we're really going to talk about what we do when we acquire the assets, what kind of entries we make, which amounts are bundled up into the asset that we are going to put on the balance sheet, and lots of other fun things that have to do with acquiring these assets. So let's go ahead and get started. So like I said, it's going to be anything long-lived that is going to be revenue-producing assets. So that could be lots of different things. We think of land, buildings, equipment, machinery, furniture, auto, trucks. Okay, if you think about those, how are those revenue producing assets? You know, that is not inventory, but it's things that we need in order to make this revenue. We need the land to put our, let's say, warehouse or our store on or maybe it's an automotive company. We need the land in order to do that, in order to bring in the revenue. We need a building for most companies, maybe now less since so many people are working from home, but we need a building. Let's say we are talking about an auto repair, so like a mechanic. So we need the land to put that building on. We need the actual building to be able to bring the cars in and work on them. All of that brings in revenue. We need the equipment, the machines. All of those things are going to ultimately help us to bring in revenue. And a lot of companies are going to need furniture, automobiles, trucks. Those are also going to be part of bringing in revenue. So if you think about Amazon, Amazon now has their own delivery trucks. And boy, do we love seeing Amazon trucks. It's like an adult ice cream truck. It's very exciting, especially when you know that you are getting a delivery. Very exciting. So that is something that helps Amazon to produce revenue. That is a long-lived asset that helps Amazon to produce revenue. So that would be property, plant, and equipment. Natural resources also fall under that category. So when we say natural resources, we're talking about Anything that is like part of the land, so oil, gas, timber, so we're talking about maybe like a forest that we're cutting down the trees, mineral deposits, we could be talking about a coal mine. So it's a piece of property you're buying that has natural resources that you are ultimately going to use, this, you're going to turn into inventory to sell it. And then we have intangible assets, which typically falls into a separate category under these long-lived revenue-producing assets. <clears throat> so intangible assets are going to be things like patents, copyrights, trademarks, franchises, and goodwill. We are going to get into the details of each of those later on in this chapter, so I'm not going to get into all those right now, but you've probably remember hearing this stuff a little bit from accounting 101 from your first accounting class but we are going to get more into detail about those so intangible assets it doesn't have a physical substance but it is something that's going to help you bring in revenue having a copyright on your um, literature is going to help you to bring in revenue so people can't copy it um, having a patent on your design is going to be revenue producing because it's going to prevent people from copying your design. So we'll get into that more later on, but those are all types of assets that are long lived and revenue producing.
<clears throat> All right, so first let's look at property, plant, and equipment for the SimTech Corporation. You probably have this example or a similar one in your book, depending on which edition you have. So on the balance sheet for SimTech Corporation, we are going to see all of this different property, plant, and equipment listed out. This could be the subledger for the balance sheet. So this is where it's really broken out um, into a separate financial statement, into a more detailed one. Maybe the ultimate balance sheet just says property, plant, and equipment and has these sums or it might be broken out this way. It kind of depends on what the company, what that particular company does. But here we see the January 2016 and January 2015 amounts for property, plant, and equipment. So we have it listed out, the property that they own, the amount that that is valued at at the time, the buildings and how much that's valued at, leasehold improvements, we're gonna talk about a lot of these things more in detail, these line items. We've got our machinery and equipment listed out, enterprise resource planning systems, furniture and office equipment, construction and progress. All of those things are long lived assets that are gonna produce revenue. So then we add all of those assets up to get a total. And then the ultimate amount that is reflected on the balance sheet is going to be net of accumulated depreciation and amortization. We will learn more about depreciation and amortization in this semester, but you probably remember some of that from your first accounting class as well. So any of our PP&E assets are gonna be listed with the Book value is going to be the amount that we paid for it, most likely, minus the depreciation and amortization. So here are some for 2016. January 2016 is $101,006, $115,471 for January of 2015. So we list out basically the cost of each and then subtract out depreciation that gives us the amount that we reflect on the balance sheet. For intangible assets, very similar. We have 2016 and 2015. Here we have the amortization listed out um, in a different column. It's same thing here. We just have them listed out um, for the individual items. So we have our gross amount. That's likely the amount that we paid for those initially. And we're gonna talk about what all is wrapped into that initial cost, what we have to expense out and what we can wrap up into the asset. And then we subtract out the accumulated amortization. So <clears throat> we had $6,991 in our intangible assets in 2016 then we have to subtract out the accumulated amortization, which is gonna be higher each year as we amortize those more and more, which was $4,772. And it was a little bit less amortization in the year before. So the net amount of those is how much is gonna be reflected on the balance sheet. Okay, so this just looks like a lot of information, um, but this basically talks about what is wrapped up into the equipment, land, land improvements, each of those things, and then which cost can be capitalized, which costs can go on the balance sheet for those items. We are gonna look at these individually, so I'm gonna skip through this slide. This is also found in your book, but it's helpful information, but we're gonna look at them in detail in just a minute. We have the same thing for our intangible assets, and we'll talk about that later in the chapter. So whenever we are looking at the PP&E and intangible assets, we have different ways that we could acquire those. Purchasing them is obviously going to be one of the most common ways in order to acquire an asset. Self-construction, so maybe we have a machine that we built ourselves in our own warehouse 
that's also something, a, a way that you might come across, come upon um, an asset donation. Maybe someone gave it to you. Business combination. So maybe you bought another business, somebody bought you or you combined. Um, either way, the, the equipment may now be on your balance sheet. You could lease it, which is kind of like renting it or exchange it. So maybe you have a machine that you're not using anymore. Another company has a machine they're not using and you trade it, or maybe you both trade a truck, you know, so you're exchanging those items. So either way, regardless of which way you acquire the asset, the initial cost is going to be that purchase price, whatever price it costs you to get the item, plus all expenditures necessary to bring the asset to its desired condition and location for use. Again, we will look at these different types of assets broken out so we can see what all would be wrapped up into those costs. But ultimately the, co the initial cost, the cost that we are gonna capitalize, that we're gonna put on the balance sheet is our purchase price, plus all those other expenditures to get it where it needs to be and in working order. So let's say we have a piece of equipment. So what kind of costs are wrapped up in equipment? First, we have that purchase price. We're always gonna do the purchase price first. And sales tax is gonna be added to the cost of equipment. We could not have acquired this equipment without paying sales tax. Um, if you did, then you wouldn't have sales tax wrapped up in the price. But if you did incur sales tax, then that was part of getting that piece of equipment. So it needs to be wrapped up in the cost. Transportation cost. It costs you money, or if it costs you money, to get that piece of equipment shipped to you, however that may have been, that was part of the initial cost. That's part of the cost you need to wrap up into the amount that you're putting on the balance sheet. So that would also go into the cost of the equipment. Installation. So if you have to pay someone to install the equipment in order for it to be in working order, that cost can also be wrapped up into the cost of equipment. And any kind of testing, testing to get it to the point where you can start using it, okay? So if you have not used this equipment yet to produce, let's say inventory or produce revenue, however that may be, but you have to do some test work, maybe even have to go through some scrap to get the test done, that can all be wrapped into the cost of equipment. And legal fees, sometimes there may be legal fees wrapped up into getting this equipment that would also be put into the cost of equipment. So let's look at an example, okay? So we have the initial cost of equipment for central machine tools. They purchased an industrial lath to be used in the manufacturing process. The purchase price was 62,000. So you see down below, we put the 62,000. Central paid a freight company $1,000 to transport the machine to its plant location, plus $300 of shipping insurance. All of that was necessary to bring that piece of equipment safely to the location of the plant. In addition, the machine had to be installed and mounted on a special platform built specifically for the machine at the cost of $1,200. So installation for that special foundation, yes, that price was also included. It needed to be spent in order to get this um, piece of equipment working. After installation, several trial runs were made to ensure proper operation. The cost of these trials, including wasted materials, was $600. We are going to include those trial runs into the amount that we're going to capitalize. So in this case, all of those costs would be included into the amount that we're going to capitalize. So we add them together, $65,100 is the amount that you would see on the balance sheet for this specific piece of machinery for central machine tools. All right, we have lots of these little concept checks, which I think will be really helpful throughout the semester. 
to make sure that we're understanding it. So it's just more practice for us, which is always a great thing. So let's go ahead and look at this one now. So this is just checking what we just learned. So the following expenditures related to equipment purchased by Symington uh, Corporation, they have the purchase price of 48,000, transportation costs of 2,400, installation and special wiring of 1,500, and testing of 6,000. So how much would they record as the purchase of equipment? Are all of these amounts things that we can include, we can capitalize and put on the balance sheet? Yes, they are. So what we are going to do is we are just going to add up each of the amounts here, the 48,000, 2,400, 1,500, 6,000, and that's going to give us our answer of 57,900. Okay, so let's look at what goes into the cost of land. So our purchase price, of course, when we buy land, we have our purchase price. We have the attorney fees. So if we have to pay somebody, which likely you would, any kind of real estate that you close on, you're going to pay an attorney. You're going to pay a real estate agent a lot of times for their commission. That's going to be wrapped up into it. The cost related to the title and title search can be included in the cost of land. Recording fees, all of that is going to be all these legal type things that are going to go into purchasing land. Any back taxes, liens, mortgages, or other obligations. So this is where the person who used to own the land owed money. They owed taxes. They owed on these liens, they had money, they still need to pay on mortgages, whatever it is, if you have to pay that in order to get the land, that would also be included. However, make sure you note that the current portion of property taxes, which a lot of times you have to pay at closing, are not included. That would be expensed in the current period. Also, any expenditures for clearing, filling, draining, and even removing old buildings would also be included. So if you have an old building like this that you will not be using, you need to get it off the property, or maybe you have a big hole that you need to fill, whatever it may be, to get the land into working order, those costs can also be included in the cost of the land. Proceeds from the sale of the salvage materials. So let's say we were able to sell the wood. People want to do the shiplap and make it look like um, Chip and Joanna Gaines' house. If you were able to sell those, the amount that you get for that salvage material would reduce the cost of the land. So all that money you spent, you'd be able to subtract out the amount that you were able to make off of that. So we got rid of this old building. We were able to sell some metal um, for scrap. We were able to get rid of some of this old wood because people wanted to put it in their house. That would be subtracted from the cost of land. Okay, so let's look at an example. The Buyer Structural Metal Company purchased a six acre tract of land and an existing building for 500,000. Okay, so they have their land and it has a building on it. They purchased it for 500,000. The company plans to remove the old building and construct a new office building on the site. Since they're removing it, it's gonna be part of the cost of the land. In addition to the purchase price, the company made the following expenditures at closing of the purchase. They had title insurance of 3,000. They have commissions of 16,000 and property taxes of 6,000. We've got a little asterisk here. Let's read what we need to know about those property taxes. So the $6,000 in property taxes include 4,000 of delinquent taxes paid by buyers on behalf of the seller. Okay, so 4,000 of the 6,000, we had to pay because the last people did not pay it. That was mandatory in order for us to get the land. 2,000 of it, was attributable to the portion of the current fiscal year after the purchase date. So that's this year's taxes. Shortly after closing, the company paid a, paid a contractor $10,000 to tear down the old building and remove it from the site. An additional 5,000 was paid to grade the land. 
Okay, so of all of these amounts, what would be included in the cost of land? So we have the purchase price of 500,000, that would be included. We have the title insurance of 3,000, that would be included, that was necessary. We had to pay the commissions of 16,000, probably to the realtor. We had to pay 4,000 of the delinquent property taxes. Remember, since that was delinquent, we had to pay what the last person didn't. We are gonna include that in the capitalized cost, but notice we left the other 2,000 out. That is gonna be expensed in the current year because that's the current year's property taxes. We also had to pay to remove the old building. So we're gonna add that cost in there for 10,000. And we had the cost of grading for 5,000. We include that also. So we had to get the land to working order with that extra 15,000 there in the last two items. So when we add all of these capitalizable items, our cost of land was 538,000. So there's that property tax note. <clears throat> That's why we had it at 4,000 because 2,000 of it was the current months, uh, the current year's cost. All right, let's talk about land improvements. So what do land improvements include? So we have this big, beautiful plot of land. So if we add stuff to it, not talking about getting it um, level, getting it the way that we need it to be to put a building on it, but if we start adding things to it, like let's say a parking lot or a sidewalk, or we get a lot of um, uh, landscaping, we had some trees, some flowers, all of those land improvements are a separate item. Let me tell you why. We'll get more into detail about this later, but the land itself, we do not depreciate, okay? There's no depreciation for land itself because we expect, of course, the market goes up and down, but for the most part, we do not expect land to lose its value that piece of earth is going to still be there at the end of your business. There's no reason to depreciate it. It's not like a building that's breaking down. Land will still be there at the end. However, land improvements can be depreciated. A parking lot, that's gonna break down. It is going to get wear and tear. It will need to be repaired, maybe even repaved or redone later on. A sidewalk, same thing. Same thing with landscaping. So we keep the price of land and land improvements separate on the balance sheet for that reason. All right, a couple more items we'll cover in this lecture today, the cost of the buildings. So we've got our land, big beautiful plot of land. We took down that old nasty building. Now, what can we include in the cost of the building itself? Of course, we're gonna include the purchase price. So how much we paid for it, the realtor's commissions, just like the land, <clears throat> reconditioning costs, if we have to put in some extra costs to get it to where it needs to be, um, and then legal fees would also be included. So all of those are pretty obvious things that would be included in the cost of the building. How about the cost of natural resources? Okay, so we bought a plot of land, let's say we're, we bought a big forest, we are going to use the timber as inventory, we're gonna sell that lumber. So what can we include? So we include the, the timber tracks, mineral deposits, oil and gas deposits, those are all whatever we paid for right in the beginning. So that's basically like the purchase price. So benefits are derived from their physical consumption. So in other words, using those resources up is what is going to, um, we're gonna deplete that natural resources as we remove coal from the mine, as we remove timber from the forest, we are using up that natural resources. That's how we, just like depreciation, we are depleting our natural resource. So the cost wrapped up into it is the purchase price and any other costs necessary to bring that asset to condition and location for its use. If you have to develop that natural resource, 
So maybe you have to um, dig into the coal mine. You have to um, put in different equipment that would be wrapped up into the natural resource that could be wrapped up into the cost of the resource. All right, we are going to look at asset retirement obligations before we finish up this lecture. This is going to be the hardest uh, concept of this lecture. So stick with me. You can always replay this video. This is where we're going to get into some, um, some calculations. And we are going to look at a couple of examples. So stick with me. And always, you can reach out with questions. So sometimes we have an existing legal obligation associated with disposing or retiring a tangible long-lived asset. So in other words, if we have like a mine, we might have a legal obligation to bring that mine to a certain um, quality, I guess, to it might have certain things that we have to do before we walk away from it. So those are going to be obligations that we have. That's going to be like a liability we have. So GAAP requires our asset retirement obligation, our AROs, to be recognized as a liability and measured at fair value. If you can reasonably get that fair value estimated. Before the year 2001, which was a long time ago now, some companies recognized this asset retirement obligations gradually over the life of the asset, while others did not recognize the obligation until the asset was retired or sold. <clears throat> so yeah, oil and gas, as an example, exploration company might be required to restore the land to its original condition after extraction is completed. So think about it. You've got this plot of land that you're going to get the oil and gas from. So you've got all kinds of holes you're digging, all kinds of um, equipment tearing up the land. And you might have a legal obligation to get that land looking like it did beforehand, filling in holes and things like that, which can be very costly. So that would be a liability that you're going to have at the end of that asset life. All right, we got a nice long example here, but hopefully it will help everybody to understand it. The Jackson Mining Company paid a million dollars for the right to explore for a coal deposit on 500 acres of land in Pennsylvania. Cost of exploring for the coal deposit totaled 800,000 and intangible de development costs incurred in digging and erecting the mine shaft were 500,000. In addition, Jackson purchased new excavation, that's a tough word to say, equipment for the project at a cost of 600,000. After the coal is removed from the site, the equipment will be sold. Jackson is required by its contract to restore the land to a condition suitable for recreational use after it extracts the coal. So it has to be able to get that land back where it was, where they can use it for other things when they're finished. The company has provided the following three cash flow possibilities for the restoration costs to be paid in three years. So for uh, these companies, a lot of times they have, like it says, different possibilities of cash outflow that they're expecting. So they think there's a 30% chance that the cash flow will be about 500,000. 50% chance it will be 600,000. And there's a 20% chance it's gonna cost them 700,000. It's also important for us to know what the company's credit adjusted interest rate is gonna be. And it tells us it's 8%. So what do we do with all this information is the question. So let's walk through it. So first, we are going to take each of the different scenarios, the 500,000 at 30%, 600,000 at 50, and 700,000 at 20%, and we are going to get our estimated asset retirement obligation. So we take the 500,000, that there's a chance, a 30% chance that it's going to cost them 500,000. So we take 500,000 times 
30%, 500,000 times 0.3. That gives us 150,000. Then we take the 600,000, there's a 50% chance it's gonna cost 600,000. So we take the 600,000 times 0.5 or 50%, which is 300,000. And then the 700,000 times 20% or 0.2, which gives us 140,000. And then we add all of those together, which gives us 590,000. So with all of these scenarios and the, the likelihood, the percentage of them happening, we come up with an estimated asset retirement obligation of 590,000. So that's saying we think that with these three scenarios, taking all of them into account, we think that it's gonna cost an estimate of 590,000 to get our piece of land after mining it for all the coal over three years, we think it's going to take about 590,000 to get it back to its recreational use, which we are legally obligated to do. So we are then gonna find the present value of that 590,000. We wanna know how much is that now, today at our 8% rate um, compared to three years from now. So we would look at our present value chart. I don't have a copy of it on here, but we have a present value chart, the present value of $1, three years from now at 8%. So we would go to period three at 8%. That would give us a factor of 0.79383. We take that factor and multiply it by our estimated amount of 590,000. And it tells us our liability needs to be $468,360. Again, feel free to pause this, rewind it, and see how we walk through that example again. Now, when it comes to the total amount that we're capitalizing for this coal, we're gonna start with the purchase price of a million dollars. We have the exploration costs of 800,000 and the development costs of 500,000. And then we are going to put that $468,360 and we're gonna add that to it that will give us our total cost of coal deposit. Okay, so we took all of those costs that are wrapped up in buying it, and then we added in the amount that we figured out there for our restoration, for bringing it back to what it was gonna be. So let's look at our, what our journal entry will be with this situation. So we bought our coal mine for the total cost that we see right up top, the two, million seven hundred sixty eight thousand three hundred sixty dollars that's an asset so we debit the asset and then we are going to credit the cash that we spent we did not spend the cash for the restoration cost that's in the future we're going to have to spend that amount so we only had to spend cash of the top three amounts that actually came out of pocket then we're going to take that asset retirement amount, the restoration costs, and we're gonna put it as a liability. So we credited cash because that is decreasing our asset and we're crediting our liability because we are creating that liability. So our excavation equipment, we also had to purchase. That's gonna be separate. It told us that we are gonna sell that separately at the end. So we are going to have the excavation equipment as an asset on the balance sheet for 600,000. And then we show our cash going out. This is not wrapped up in the amount of the coal mine. All right, we're almost through it. We're getting through, you're doing a good job. Um, always feel free to ask questions. So each year we are going to be taking our asset retirement obligation amount multiplying that by the 8%, and then we are gonna increase the balance of that obligation. Okay, so we started out with the 468,360. That's what we calculated. We started out with that as our asset retirement obligation. 
We multiplied that by 8% and that gave us $37,469. That's what we are gonna increase the asset retirement obligation um, balance by. So when we add the $37,469 to the amount we already had in our asset retirement obligation, we now have $505,829 in our asset retirement obligation account. Then in year two, we're gonna take that amount, the 505,000 times 8%, so times 0.08, that gives us an increase, an accretion expense of $40,466. We're going to add that to the balance. We now have the asset retirement obligation of $546,295. When we multiply that by 8% in year three, we are going to recognize an expense of $43,705. Plus, it will increase our balance by that amount for our asset retirement obligation, meaning at the end of our three years, when we are done with this coal mine, we now have $509,000 in our asset retirement obligation account, which is how much we expect it's going to cost for us to get the coal back to its, uh, to get the coal mine back to the recreational use, to our legal obligation. So each time, each year, we are going to take the amount that we calculated. We're going to debit accretion expense. Remember, it's an expense account. So we always want to debit it. It's going to decrease income. And we're going to credit the asset retirement liability because we believe at the end we're going to have that liability that we have to pay. If the actual restoration costs are more or less than the $590,000, we recognize either a loss or a gain. So let's say it actually cost us $625,000. Oh, that stinks. It costs more than what we had accounted for. So when we actually pay that amount out, we are going to get rid of that asset retirement liability, the $590,000, by debiting it because it was a credit account. We no longer have that liability. But since we had to pay cash, we had to decrease that cash asset by $625,000 we're going to recognize a $35,000 loss. If it would have been less than the $590,000, we would have recognized a gain. All right, so I think that was my, well, we do have one more little concept check, check here. Um, so we're just going to run through a concept check for this cost of land, and then I'll let you go on this video. So this mining company paid $50 million for the right to explore and extract copper from land owned by the state of Wyoming. To obtain the rights, they agreed to restore the land to a suitable condition for other uses after its exploration. So same as the other situation, we have legal requirements to return the land to where it can be used for other things later. Um, they incurred exploration and development costs of $15 million. The company's credit adjusted risk-free interest to 6%. Remember the other one was 8%, this one's 6%. This is the estimated possible cash flows for restoring the land in three years. So here we only have two different options. We think it may cost 5 million. There's a 40% chance it will cost 5 million but there's a 60% chance it's gonna cost 10 million. That is a huge range, but we're gonna do the same thing we did before. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're gonna take the 5 million times 40% and the 10 million times 60%. We'll add those two together to figure out how much it's gonna, um, our probability is gonna be. So when we do that, we take our 5 million times 40%, and our 10 million times 60% and add those together, it's gonna to give us $8 million. We then are gonna multiply it by our present value factor. We're gonna look at the present value chart. We're gonna take our three, our period three, because it tells us three years, and our 6%, and it's gonna give us the factor of 0.83962, 
We'll multiply the $8 million by that. It will give us $6,716,960 as the present value of our restoration cost. So in this question, it's asking what's the initial cost of the copper mine? We're going to take our $50,000 purchase cost, the 15, or $50 million, the $15 million cost to um, for the exploration. And then we're going to add in the asset retirement obligation of $6,716,960. When you add all of those up, it's going to be $71,716,960 in order to buy this piece of land that they're going to use to mine. Please reach out with questions and I hope you have a great rest of your day.